So, Jun, are you ready? Yeah. Hi, thank you so much. This was uh, thank you all for uh, joining my talk today. Um, as this was mentioned, uh, today I'm going to um, present some of the results from the uh, DTC funded uh, project, uh, the, the visitors program. Um, I want to firstly thank the support from DTC. I especially want to thank Ivan Kalina and the BISWORS for their help with um, uh, HWORF idealized simulations. I also want to acknowledge EMC, DTC, and HRD uh, colleagues for their continuous development of HWORF and documentation and other colleagues from universities that who contributed to the uh, improvement of HWORF. So for this project, um, I have two object objectives. Uh, the first one is to uh, review and further understand uh, recent upgrades of the uh, boundary scheme in each world. As we all know that uh, we have done um, uh, different changes in the uh, PBL scheme of each world in the past uh, uh, 10 years or so. Uh, the second objective is to evaluate and understand the impacts of different PBL schemes in each world on herd intensity and structure, uh, including uh, other types of PBL schemes such as YSU and MYN. But uh, today I'm going to focus on uh, looking into the impacts of the uh, PBL schemes uh, that were used in operational HWARF uh, on the uh, TC simulations. Um, firstly, I want to give you some background. Um, so um, here's uh, some of the uh, results from uh, Ron Tao 2000 paper uh, in this. Um, Study they run uh, MM5 simulations uh, of Hurricane Bob using four different types of boundary layer schemes. Um, you can see that this figure shows the uh, simulated uh, storm intensity in terms of both minimum sea level pressure and maximum wind as a function of forecast time uh, in these simulations. And RF scheme is the medium range forecast scheme. Uh, they use a K-profile method. Uh, the black dark scheme use a uh, mixing lens type of thermization for fluxes, and also Brooke Thompson scheme and the box scheme. So you can see that the simulated intensity, uh, for instance, in terms of VMAX, uh, vary a lot with these different schemes. I mean, if you look at the forecast hour, uh, T equal 60, uh, you see the, the, the similar intensity varies from 50 meters per second to about 70 meters per second. So, um, so, so this uh, paper is uh, one of the first uh, seminal papers that uh, point out the importance of uh, boundary layer physics uh, for hurricane simulations and prediction. And, and they point out that the skillful prediction of hurricane intensity requires an accurate representation of the boundary layer structure. So here's another example. Um, this is um, the uh, herd intensity simulated using Warfare W by uh, Dave Nolan uh, for uh, Hurricane Isabel 2003. And you can see that um, similar to the M5 simulation, um, as in uh, Brian Tao's paper, uh, by running the Warfare W using two different types of boundary schemes. So YSU is the Yonsei University uh, scheme. And MYJ here is the um, Miller Yamada gen uh, scheme is a tick turbulent can energy type of scheme. Uh, you can see the same intensity um, very uh, substantially. And uh, Dave Nolan also run these two uh, boundary schemes with uh, different um, uh, dry curves uh, in the surface layer. For instance, here D here represents dominant at all dry curves. So by using the, the Sound light or uh, drag action, they simulated the uh, storm intensity is larger compared to the the other scheme. So, so essentially, I mean, basically, um, it shows that uh, the um, current intensity is definitely sensitive to the choice of PBL schemes in different types of models. And uh, this is uh, the um, result uh, I'm going to present mostly in this study. This is uh, um, the um, this. These are uh, HWARF simulations, idealized HWARF simulations with different types of schemes. Here, um, uh, again, I'm plotting the um, uh, storm intensity, the VMAX here, as a function of forecast time. 
So PBL 11, 12 to 19, that basically uh, the number here represents the year of the version of h wolf operational h wolf used. Uh, and basically, you can see that, for instance, for PBL 13 to 14, uh, there's, there's no change in these two years. So, uh, and also, um, uh, I included uh, the um, simulations with uh, the original ID Max Flux scheme, EDMF scheme, uh, YSU scheme, and the MIN scheme. Uh, thanks again to uh, Ivan Kalina and the Beast Wars for their help with these um, simulations. And again, you can see that in, again, with another model, this h wolf model, you, you can see that the similar the intensity, uh, not only the uh, the maximum intensity with the cell day uh, simulations, is different among these um, simulations, but also you can see the, the speed up rate uh, can also be different when we change uh, the boundary schemes. I mean, uh, just point out that uh, you know, this uh, PBL 15 uh, creates uh, the strongest storm, um, while the PBL 11 and the, the unchanged EDMF scheme produce the weakest storm at the end of the five day uh, simulations. So uh, today I'm going to uh, basically try to understand uh, how and why different types of uh, CDL schemes and uh, different versions of h wolf schemes would impact the uh, structure in comparison to some uh, uh, observations. So uh, I mentioned about the boundary parameterization. Um, so why do we uh, parameterize these turbulent processes? It's very sound graded scale processes in the regional models. I mean, we know, we know that in climate model, of course, we need to parameterize it. But for regional model, we still need these, uh, the parameterization because the model resolution, for instance, the original h wolf model has a horizontal grid spacing of 1.5 kilometer that still couldn't resolve uh, all scales of turbine ID. So th here is the figure from uh, um, George Brand's uh, 2017 paper. Uh, this figure plus the uh, spectrum of the allowance component uh, wind velocity as a function of frequency. So basically, the y-axis uh, represents turbulent energy. And this frequency, uh, uh, the, the larger the frequency, the smaller the scales of turbulent eddy that can be resolved uh, by um, by this model. So, so, so you can see the George he run the RES simulations with 30 meter resolution, even down to 10 meter resolution. And with this, Really small uh, grid spacing, like REI simulation. You can see that this, these models you know, actually go. They, they could actually resolve the inertial sub range. And compared to this uh, thick black line here, this from observations from in situ uh, data, you can see the as the uh, REI model resolution decreases, and uh, the better it can resolve the inertial sub range. So I plotted this uh, the vertical blue uh, line here. This basically represents the the, the, the scales that um, H-Wolf model, for instance, can resolve. I mean, it, 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 uh, on the left-hand side of this line. So, so basically for smaller scale turbine eddies, I mean, like reading the model like H-Wolf couldn't resolve this, um, this uh, turbine eddies. That's why we need to characterize the fluxes. So um, in H-Wolf, um, the, the, uh, in the latest version of H-Wolf is actually used the EDMF scheme. So this is the ID. If you see the mass flux scheme, on the, on the equation here on the right hand side, it's basically the flux equals um, uh, the, uh, the vertical eddy divisivity um, multiplied the vertical gradient domain uh, quantity, and any variable could be wind velocity or temperature humidity. And, and also, the, the non local term is actually parameterized using a mass flux uh, method. And it, uh, before 2016, uh, the H wolf, you know, Actually, you know, each one we use the um, basically ID diffusivity type of scheme. Uh, in early uh, years, like uh, 2011, it's basically the MRF scheme, and um, later on, that uh, MRF scheme was modified um, based on observation. Especially, uh, we modified the uh, vertical ID diffusivity KM here. This is for momentum transfer. Uh, here's the equation for the uh, vertical ID diffusivity. Here, um, so I mean, the, for the YSU scheme, also use this K profile type of uh, method. I mean, basically, the, the parameterization for the non local term gamma here is a little bit different uh, from the uh, MRF type of scheme. So, 
So, um, and this figure here is actually a schematic diagram shows how uh, the vertical diversity varies with height. This is a, this figure was taken from a paper of over in uh, 1970. Um, so basically in the surface layer, K is nearly a linear function um, of height. And above the surface layer, K increases with height uh, to um, the height of a maximum and then decreases with height. So this is a, basically the, 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 the compact concept of K profile method. So we use the, um, because we couldn't resolve all scales of turbine IDs, so we use um, the, this vertical adaptivity to link, uh, the, um, link the flux with the mean uh, quantity. So um, just want to give you some history um, uh, on what we did um, in terms of modifying the h wolf uh, boundary scheme. So this is the, the work um, uh, we did uh, back to uh, 2012, 2013. So at that time we were we were evaluating uh, the um, 2011 version of HWOLF. Uh, in the 2010 version of HWOLF, actually um, it had uh, had a resolution of 27 to 9 kilometer resolution. And uh, after that year, the resolution was decreased, and we put a, a third mass that increased the resolution to uh, three kilometer um, grid spacing. So. Uh, no matter um, how we change the resolution, you can see this here. What I'm showing you is the um, the RG radius height plot of the radial velocity uh, in the two versions of the H4 model. The, the high resolution versus uh, high resolution on the right, low resolution on the left uh, in the H4 forecast. And compared to the Jobson composite uh, of the bottom figure, you can see that if you look at this uh, the white line, that's uh, the top of the inflow layer uh, defined as the height of 10% peak inflow, you see that um, in the earlier version of h wolf the simulator, the inflow layer depth or boundary height is too deep compared to observation. That, uh, that's uh, how we identified this uh, model deficiency in terms of the hurricane structure by comparing uh, the h wolf forecast to observation. And then to understand why the, the, um, the boundary too deep uh, in h wolf uh, forecast at that time. So we look at the uh, the boundary um, parameterization, especially we look at the uh, the vertical adjacency. And here, um, I plotted the vertical adjacency km as a function of wind speed at um, about 450 meter altitudes. And compared to the observations uh, based on fly level data in hurricanes Hugo and Island, and we found that the uh, the the boundary layer in the uh, prior 2011 version of HWOF is too diffusive. You can see the, I mean, at a wind speed of 60 meters per second, uh, the HWOF um, PBL scheme has KM in the order of uh, 400 meters square per second. This is uh, too large compared to observations. So working with the EMC and HRD colleagues, uh, so we lowered the uh, vertical adaptivity in HWOF. So, I mean, this is um, not a physical um, type of tuning, basically. I mean, this is kind of like a tuning type of method. So, uh, so what we did, we put an alpha parameter into this um, KM equation. And um, so the, in the 2012 version of HWARF, um, so we put alpha equals 0.5. So we lower this, this uh, work that it is to be closer to observations. And um, actually, the, just the lowering this, um, using this method, actually, the uh, lowering adaptivity, uh, we got um, uh, improved uh, intensity and the track forecast. Uh, I'm going to show you in the next in this slide. So, uh, so this slide shows the uh, the actual track error and intensity error as a function of forecast uh, time for two types of H1 forecast using the operational model. Uh, this this. Is, uh, this is a clean experiment. The only change is the boundary layer scheme. This is the alpha parameter. So we have a total of around 120 cases. As you can see that compared, when we lower the vertical adaptivity in the um, 2012 version of H-Wolf, um, we, we see um, about 5% uh, improvement into uh, the track forecast, although the, the, the improvement is small. Uh, but in terms of the intensity forecast, the intensity error uh, was actually reduced uh, 
uh, by five to uh, fifteen percent, especially uh, before seventy-two hour uh, forecast time. And so, and this improvement is actually uh, statistically significant for uh, most of these uh, forecast hours. So basically, I mean, the, what we did is we uh, use observations to tune the model physics, and then we evaluate the impact of the um, the change in, in physics in terms of intensity and track forecast. We also look at the impacts of uh, the changes in the uh, boundary physics on the TC structure. Uh, I'm just going to show you uh, one example in terms of the storm size. Uh, this is again using the uh, 120 uh, forecast, retrospective forecast, uh, comparing PBL 11 and PBL 12 um, performance. Uh, so here, what I'm showing you is a histogram of the uh, radius of maximum wind speed at 10 meter uh, altitude. Uh, the upper panel is from the PBL 11 forecast, and the middle panel is for the uh, PBL 12 forecast, and the bottom panel is from the uh, step frequency microwave uh, radiometer observation in the same storms, basically. Um, so you can see that um, when we lower the vertical diffusivity from PBL 11 to PBL 12, on average, the MW um, decreased from uh, about 53 kilometers to 44 kilometers. And, and this, uh, the storm size in terms of MW uh, is much closer to observed uh, value um, from SF Mar. Um, so definitely uh, the storm size becomes smaller when we lower the um, vertical diffusivity. Uh, I mean, you, you, you can see that the, the simulated storm is still much larger than the truth, but, but we do see some uh, substantial improvement uh, in terms of the structure. We also look at other uh, structural metrics, for instance, PBL height and um, eyeball slope, et cetera. Um, so I'm just showing you uh, one result here for the real case uh, uh, forecast uh, uh, evaluations. And uh, next, I'm going to focus on the, uh, the idealized case. Oh, oh sorry. So, so here's another example of the um, impact of uh, uh, lowering diffusivity on the um, uh, skills of h -Wolf in terms of rapid intensification of forecasts. So we have um, 55 uh, forecasts for real cases um, uh, running uh, H-Wolf with uh, PBL 11, PBL 12, and then we evaluated the uh, the total score in terms of the critical success index. Um, so in this figure, um, what I'm showing you is the prob probability of detection on, on the y-axis and the success successful ratio on the x-axis, which is equal to a one minus false alarm rate. And if you look at these curves, numbers on these um, uh, along this curve, the 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, those are the uh, the score, the, the the critical success index. When this CSI uh, equals a one, that means a perfect RI forecast. So comparing this um, this RI forecast score, we found that uh, when we lower uh, the KM, the ideal diffusivity in the h wolf boundary scheme, actually this uh, score is um, uh, increased. Uh, substantially, and uh, that tells us the uh, RI forecast uh, will improve. Um, will actually improved uh, the scale of RI forecast was improved uh, um, when we uh, lower the uh, work activity. So um, I mentioned I briefly mentioned about the changes uh, in the uh, boundary scheme um, in HWORF in the past year. Is actually I mentioned about how we did a uh, uh, the change in KM in 2011 to 2012 version of HWARF. Um, so here is the a history, a summary of the history of the recent PBL scheme upgrades in HWARF. Uh, so on the right most panels, it shows the, um, so, so again, I labeled it the PBL scheme by the year, so PBL 11, basically the PBL in the 2011 version of HWARF, et cetera. So you can see that Basically, in the uh, in the past um, uh, almost ten years, so what we did is we, we basically focused on the change in the uh, alpha parameter uh, in this added diffusivity equation. I mean, although you, you also notice that from 2015 to 2016, uh, the version of 
the types of scheme is changed from MRF type scheme to a EDMF scheme. Um, actually, the, this alpha parameter from 2012 to 2013 was increased from 0.5 to 0.7. Uh, there's also a change in the Richardson number, especially um, near the surface. Um, the effect is uh, very small. And then in 2015, this is um, uh, Professor Robert Falwell's work. So what uh, is actually, uh, if, uh, if I'm correct, is also part of a DTC uh, visitor program. So what he did is he, he um, um, fit this alpha parameter as a function wind speed. So, so um, instead of a constant alpha, alpha varies with the wind speed. Uh, and this uh, 2015 version of H-Wolf actually uh, is the most, but uh, it's the least diffusive actually. So the, um, in the uh, 2016 and the latest version of H-Wolf, uh, besides the EDMF um, uh, scheme change, uh, the alpha is, is not only a function of wind speed, but also a, a function of height, especially near the surface layer. This is a, a weak wall one data uh, in, from EMC data this work. Um, so what I'm um, next, I'm going to show you how these different types of uh, um, or different versions of the PBL scheme affect the uh, TC uh, structure in idealized H wolf simulations. So. I've shown you the time series of uh, the um, the uh, storm intensity um, in idealized H wolf simulation with different type of schemes. Here um, uh, we just focus on the um, H wolf schemes, the PBL 11 to PBL 16, 19. Uh, here, what I'm showing you is the maximum isomutually average tangential wind speed as a function of uh, forecast hour or simulation hour. So. Uh, again, we're using the uh, 2018 version HWORF. This is a DTC released version, um, uh, well documented by DTC. Um, and again, we use the same initial condition, same boundary condition. The only change is the boundary scheme. So, so as I mentioned before, the, the PBL 15 is the least uh, diffusive uh, scheme, and while well, the PBL 11 is the most diffusive scheme. So we can see that. Um, the, not only the, the intensification rate during the uh, spin up time from 12 hours to 30 hours um, is different among the simulations, but also the maximum intensity uh, within this five day uh, forecast or simulation uh, is different. You can see when the, um, the PBL 11 uh, simulation has the um, weakest storm, while the PBL 15 um, simulation has the strongest storm. Um, I mean, the, the, uh, I mean, if you go back to this table, actually, the, the uh, you can see that uh, the in 2011 version we didn't change the KM to the best kind of uh, best largest, and then we reduced to 0.5 and then increased again, and then the 2016 version has the smallest um, uh, KM, and then the uh, the, uh, the 2016 uh, and 19 version is a little bit closer to 115 version, but slightly smaller. So you can see the in terms of the storm intensity, um, actually the it varies with it's it actually correlates with the the magnitude of, of the uh, the vertical eddy diffusivity. So we also look at the boundary inflow. So here it shows the um, this figure shows the mostly average minimum uh, radio uh, wind speed or velocity. So so, I mean, the, the, the negative value represents inflow. So, so you can see that as we, um, we lower the, uh, the vertical diversity from PBL 11 to PBL 15, you see this um, after um, 12 hours, you see the, the, the maximum inflow magnitude actually increases. Um, so, so, so this is, um, one of the main effects that we found is that uh, by changing the vertical additivity would uh, change the strength of the inflow. And, in the, and, and that um, the inflow change will also feed back to the convective activities I'll show you later. Um, and in terms of the inflow angle, which uh, represents the relative strength of the inflow and of the primary circulation, so basically the ratio um, Vr over Vt, um, so this all 
this influencer also varies with the uh, different uh, versions of the PBL scheme. Uh, basically, the vertical additivity. So you can hear what I'm showing is the surface inflow angle as a function of for R over MW, uh, the scale by for the radius, scale by the radius of maximum wind speed. Um, so for each color uh, represents each uh, version of the PBL scheme um, and the simulation. And also, uh, uh, I, this uh, sign color curve here shows the uh, observation. These are from the drop sound composites uh, from my 2012 paper. So you can see that when uh, when we um, modified the PBL scheme, the H work from 2011 all the way to 2019, or even this year, the, you see the the inflow angle is actually uh, compared to observation is is improved. I mean the representation of inflow angle, and especially you can see the the latest version of the PBL scheme, PBL 15 and PBL 16 and 19, that produce the the best result compared to observation. I mean, the, definitely, uh, especially for the the uh, 16, 19 version, the latest version of H-Wolf, uh, all these inflow angles are mostly within the error bar of the uh, observe observations. And I mean, you can see, if you look at the PBL 11 version, um, the most effusive version, the, the inflow angle in terms of the magnitude is too small compared to observations. And for the, uh, the PBL 15 version, uh, produces uh, the magnitude of inflow angle a little bit uh, larger than the observations, especially in the eye wall region. So, I mean, definitely we see some improvement in terms of the um, the, the the structure of the the um, storm when we uh, modify the uh, the boundary scheme in H wall, but just basically modifying the uh, the what is the ID diffusivity. So. Uh, next, I'm going to show you um, some comparison of the boundary height. So this is a schematic diagram uh, from my 2011 paper. Uh, this uh, that, uh, schematic um, diagram was built uh, based on drop sound composites. So here, what I'm showing you are different uh, types of boundary height scales. So the H inflow here is the inflow rate depth I've shown you earlier. Um, so how we define it. Um, it's the top of the inflow layer, top of the strong inflow layer, and this H we max is uh, the uh, the height of the maximum uh, continual wind speed, and we also have GI here is the height of the thermodynamic nuclear depth. So this this are based on observations. So what we found is that using observation is that there's a separation of the boundary layer, uh, height defined thermodynamically and um, kinematically. So the kinematic boundary layer height uh, is uh, much larger than the thermodynamic ground height in hurricanes, and all these height scales tend to decrease uh, with decreasing um, radius. And this uh, thick black line shows the uh, the estimated boundary height using the critical retraction number method, which shows a slightly different uh, trend. A little bit, yeah. So, um, so we want to compare the boundary height scales within the idealized simulation and compare it to observation. So firstly, uh, uh, I'm going to show you the um, uh, the comparison in terms of uh, the height of maximum tangential wind speed. So we, in each panel of this uh, plot, uh, what I'm showing you here is the uh, the tangential wind speed that is normalized by its maximum value. So that the the shading here is actually the percentage. So in this way, we um, uh, we don't need to worry about the, the effects of some intensity. Um, and uh, the, this black line here basically shows the height of the maximum tangential wind speed. So we, we can, in this way, we can uh, look at the boundary height scales and compare it to the drop sound on the uh, bottom right panel here. So you can see that in the early, in PBL 11, um, definitely the, at, um, you know, around 1.5 MW radius, the the, um, the boundary height is even larger than two kilometers and is out of the range of this uh, this, this y axis and and if you see the the second largest PBL height is the PBL 13 to 14 and then PBL 12 and the latest version um, uh, of the boundary scheme H was PBL 15 and uh, uh, PBL 16 did a pretty good job actually in terms of boundary height for H V max and you can see the 
So it's much closer to observations compared to earlier uh, games. Um, since in the order of, uh, you know, in the outer core at R equals three M times M W is about um, one point um, three uh, kilometer, and decreases to about uh, six hundred meters, you know, in the eye wall region. So, so this is a definitely encouraging result. Uh, and in terms of the uh, inflow layer depth, so again, uh, the inflow depth is defined as the height uh, of ten percent maximum inflow. This black line here uh, in each panel. And again, uh, so here again, um, the shading is the percentage. So, um, uh, so, so here the inflow is normalized by the uh, maximum maximum magnitude of the of the R. So, so minus one hundred is basically minus one hundred percent. So you can see the peak inflow um, is located uh, at about hundred meters. Uh, close to the surface for all these uh, five simulations, uh, H4 idealized simulations with uh, five versions of PBL scheme. And this is a, um, this result is close to observation. I mean, in terms of the inflow layer depth, again, you can see that in the PBL 11 version, um, H4, uh, the boundary is too deep, um, is above you know, two kilometers, and it's reduced uh, to uh, PBL, I mean, 13 and 14 uh, version is with really, the uh, inflow depth is reduced slightly and then uh, for, it reduced further in the uh, PBL 12 simulation. And then um, looking at the PBL 15 and PBL 16 to 19 simulations, the simulated inflow layer depth is actually um, uh, pretty close uh, to the observed uh, inflow layer depth. So, so this. This again tells us that all this work uh, we have done to lower the vertical activity or modifying it as a function of um, wind speed or as a function of height, um, it works in terms of the improvement in terms of the boundary height. Um, I want to show you some results um, comparing the EDMF uh, scheme, uh, the original EDMF scheme uh, run versus the one. Uh, with the EDMF scheme uh, plus the alpha parameter. So uh, this is um, uh, just just show you that um, um, even with a different type of scheme, like the EDMF scheme, adding the mass, mass flux component didn't change much of the boundary height compared to the 2011 version. You know, the, the, EV, the just added diffusivity scheme um, um, also showed a you know, much larger, much, uh, boundary depth, inflow depth compared to observation. But I mean, the, so basically, like, even if we use the EDMF scheme in H4, we also needed to lower added diffusivity. So on the right hand side, you see that when we lower, we put an alpha prime, the lower added diffusivity, the inflow layer depth is reduced much closer to observation uh, compared to the unmodified version of the scheme. Um, in terms of the uh, thermodynamic mix, mix layer depth, um, so we are using the, um, the vertical gradient of virtual parameter temperature. So this, so here the black line shows the um, uh, three k per kilometer um, contour. That's the, the standard um, method we used to uh, to determine the thermodynamic mix layer depth. Um, again, I'm showing you this um, vertical gradient. Um, of uh, virtual ground temperature at the final height and uh, normalize the radius by RMW uh, in five idealized H4 simulations with different um, PBL schemes and compared to the drop sun composite on the right bottom figure. Um, so you can see, in, I mean, the, by changing the, uh, the vertical additivity uh, in these schemes didn't change much of, um, the uh, thermodynamic mix layer depth. I mean, there's a slightly a reduction from PBL 11 to PBL 12 um, in terms of this uh, thermodynamic mix layer depth, but overall the, the difference is uh, very small among these uh, these simulations. And um, uh, this the simulated mix layer depth is slightly higher than observation. 
in all these simulations. In terms of the uh, static stability or more static static stability, you can see that actually the the, the similar structure in PDL 16 and 19 uh, is actually the best. Uh, sorry, it's actually the best, especially above the uh, the mixed layer. You see this um, much stable uh, layer uh, above the from the mixed layer uh, inside the MW. That's um, comparable to observation. Uh, we also see some uh, a slightly uh, similar structure in uh, PBL 12. But but near the surface, though, um, um, the I mean the recent version of the PBL scheme um, produced is much is too um, the, the surface layer is too unstable. I mean this could be related to old. I mean all the simulation we don't have ocean coupling, but uh, um, uh, definitely the, there's some difference in terms of the stability uh, in the surface layer. But overall, uh, we didn't see much impact um, of these different type of schemes on the uh, thermodynamic nuclear depth. Um, so next, I'm going to show you the some distribution of vertical velocity uh, in the eye wall region. Uh, here, I focus on the spin up period. This is from 12 to uh, 30 hours forecast time. Um, so what I'm showing you is the uh, contour, contour frequency by altitude diagram, CFS of vertical velocity in the region close to the um, uh, the radius of maximum wind speed. So R star here is um, R over MW. So, so basically the from 0.75 uh, R star to 1.25 R star. So it's good. Um, Basically, close the region of the eye wall. Um, so basically, the the the, the, um, the color scale here shows the percentage. Uh, if you look at it, one. So basically, this plot basically shows you the the PDF at each altitude, uh, the variation of the PDF uh, by altitude. So you can see that, uh, and the the the, um, the bottom right figure shows uh, some observations uh, from Doppler radar data. Um, you can see that uh, this. If you just look at the, um, you know, the the five percent, the five percent uh, um, region, you know, the um, the, the uh, in this PBL fifteen simulation, we we, we see the strongest updrafts um, above ten kilometer altitudes. But um, but if you look at the PBL eleven simulation, uh, the maximum updrafts. Uh, produced in this simulation is around 60 meters per second. I mean, there's no larger uh, updraft, you know, compared to observation. Uh, definitely, in the when we uh, lower the adhesivity, we could uh, reproduce some, um, you know, really strong updrafts um, closer to observation. But again, I mean, the, the um, in terms of the, the vertical distribution of these um, the, the strong updrafts. Um, None of these simulations could reproduce some of these um, really strong updrafts near the top of the uh, the tropicals. So, um, but but definitely the I mean just just focus on the 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 strength of I mean the, I mean, the of these the strongest updrafts, the distribution of strongest updrafts. Definitely, we, we we do see that uh, by changing the thermometer um, scheme or vertical activity that could uh, influence the strength. Of the updraft, so this is kind of basically the interaction between the boundary layer processes and the process above the boundary layer. So when we lower the vertical adhesivity from PBL 11 to PBL 15, you see the we see much stronger updrafts. So um, to summarize uh, some of these uh, findings within this um, conceptual model, so what we find. Based on the real case forecast, especially the idealized simulations, we found what we found is that when we lower the vertical adhesivity um, from the left hand figure to right hand side, we see a much shallower uh, boundary layer, and we have stronger inflow and then and smaller size of the stone. So this stronger inflow would um, carry um, air particles uh, closer to the stone center, and also the um, the the, the updraft. Immediately above the input layer is stronger, and then also we see much stronger updraft above the boundary layer. And this could be linked to the under the efficiency argument. Um, and 
So basically, when we have larger immersibility and the stronger, uh, larger diabetic heating uh, associated with uh, strong updraft, uh, that could uh, produce stronger storm in terms of the uh, inflation argument and also in terms of the, uh, uh, the spin up dynamics, the stronger inflow would bring more um, absolute angular momentum toward the storm center that it would um, uh, offset uh, the dissipation uh, by surface friction so that um, the, we have um, larger values of net effect of redirection of angular momentum so that would help spin up the, the, the hurricane vortex. So, so essentially, um, uh, all these changes uh, in terms of the PM um, and, and the effects on the hurricane classification structure can be explained based on our analysis. So next, I want, uh, I've shown you most of, um, mostly the kinematic structure, in, for instance, inflow angle, the inflow boundary height. Uh, I've shown you the thermodynamic boundary um, steps. Um, but next, I'm gonna uh, show you some of the comparisons in terms of thermal structure, um, mainly. So this is a very interesting result, actually. So this slide shows the evolution of the warm core anomaly. Um, uh, in K here for so these five uh, idealized simulations as a function of time. So the large, so if you look at the, the peak uh, warm core anomaly, that you will see the boundary, uh, the, not the boundary height, the, the warm core height. And you can see the actually in the in the um, the first four simulations, PR 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, we 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 kind of see like a, a double warm core type of structure. You can see, but but in this um, latest version uh, PBL scheme simulation, the PBL 16 and this simulation, there's only one warm core. So this is, a, um, I suspect that uh, this may be due to the um, effect of the nice flux component you know, the, um, in this uh, PBL 16 version um, scheme. Uh, so, I mean, so I also plotted the, the Warm core anomaly, the, the maximum warm, warm core anomaly as a function of uh, minimum sea level pressure, basically the intensity, and also the warm core height uh, plotted as a function of minimum sea level pressure. You can see that there's a correlation between the uh, warm core anomaly maximum and the storm intensity, but uh, there's not much uh, correlation between the warm core height and the, uh, the storm intensity. So uh, I'm. I mean, there's still um, more work needs to be done to understand why there, in, in one simulation there's a double warm core, but the other one uh, there's only one warm core. But this structure is definitely interesting to me. Um, so uh, I mentioned about thermodynamic structure. So um, so here's the uh, plot of the um, temperature uh, as a function of, of uh, radius, normalized radius and height in these five idealized simulations and compared to drop sun composites. So here, uh, I plotted the data from 84 average, um, between 84 to 104 hours. Uh, so during this period of the storm intensity is closer to that of the drop sun composite on average. Um, so, you can, uh, so here I only plotted the, the temperature uh, below two kilometer altitudes and up to three uh, R over MW. Uh, because the drop sound composites are limited to low levels. You can see the uh, near the storm center, you see the we see um, largest uh, temperature at near the surface. Um, you know, all these simulations, and this is a closer to observation. And also near the surface layer below about, you know, 200 meters. So the structure is relatively comparable to the, uh, to observation. But if you look at the, um, the structure above um, 500 meters or 0.5 kilometers, you do see all these simulations, the simulated boundary layer, uh, low level um, structure, actually you see the, the boundary layer is uh, a little bit too cool compared to uh, the observations. So we, we see smaller magnitude of temperature in all these five simulations um, compared to observation. So this um, definitely, um, Low bias in, in terms of temperature uh, simulation um, in H dwarf. 
And also here, um, what I'm showing is the humidity uh, comparisons. This is basically uh, humidity as a function of uh, normalized radius and height in these five simulations um, compared to the uh, drop sun composite. So you can see uh, near, if you look at the sun center near the surface, um, the, the humidity uh, is actually the largest here. Um, I mean, we see similar structure in the PBL 12, 15, and uh, 16, and 20, oh, sorry, this should be PBL 16 and 19 result. Uh, in this uh, PBL 11 and PBL 13 simulation, the, um, the, so the near surface layer um, is a little bit um, too dry um, in the, in, at the thumb center near the surface. And again, um, look at the structure above the mixed layer, you know, above 500 meters. You see in all these simulations um, that the, uh, the boundary layer is basically too dry compared to the uh, drop sound composites. In all these simulations, so this, there's definitely some deficiency in terms of the temperature and the humidity structure compared to duration. And here is a result um, from uh, a real case uh, eight four forecast. This is a uh, Ivan Kalina did. Uh, so, so he compared the uh, eight four forecast of Hurricane Maria case uh, with the uh, quality of duration. The quality is the MN aircraft. Uh, that was dropped in Hurricane Maria. I was actually uh, was in the flight. Uh, I was on the D3 flight in, during this mission. Um, so what Ivan did, he compared the uh, H4 forecasted temperature with um, the quality observations on the, um, the here. The, uh, the upper left panel shows the, for, the initial time forecast hour. Uh, so at t equals zero. And then the, on the right hand side, upper right panel shows the comparison of dew point temperature uh, between H wharf and uh, observation. So you can see at initial time, the H wharf um, model, the field is um, much cooler and drier than the observation. Uh, this is actually uh, in agreement with um, the, the idealized result I showed you. Before and also he also compared the um, the field at uh, t equals seventy two. Um, again, he found the similar result. The quality was dropped in the boundary layer. Uh, just uh, to note this, um, I mean you see that there's there's some uh, dry and cool bias in this uh, in the H four forecast in this case study, and this is uh, consistent with our idealized uh, result. So uh, next, I'm going to show you some um, results. Just quickly show you some results of the uh, comparison between the HWARF, um, the latest version of HWARF uh, PBL scheme, uh, and YSU and MIN scheme uh, in idealized HWARF simulations using the same version of the, the HWARF model from the 18 version. Um, so here is the plot of the, the um, uh, some intensity at a, at the function forecast time. I also showed uh, the uh, original uh, EDMF scheme result. You can see the this black dash line here shows the intensity from this simulation. Uh, without the alpha parameter, you see we see a much weaker storm, similar to the 2011 version H work um, model did. And in terms of the intensification rate, actually the uh, the uh, compared uh, to YSU and the MNN scheme, the the uh, the PBL 16 to 19 uh, HWARF scheme actually uh, did a similar um, job. And basically, you can see, you see that this comparable intensification rate. Uh, the YSU scheme um, intensifies the storm a little bit faster than the other two schemes. Uh, in terms of maximum intensity, uh, the overall maximum intensity. Um, in the uh, PBL 16-19 simulation is comparable to that in the live fuel scheme, while the, uh, the maximum intensity in the MYN simulation is, uh, is a little bit uh, smaller uh, than the other two uh, uh, simulations. So we're all kind of comparable in terms of the intensity um, simulation. So I also compared the inflow angle 
in this uh, 3D simulation to the um, drop sun composite. So you can see the, I mean, the, um, the, uh, the result from the MRN uh, simulation is uh, comparable to that in the uh, HWAR, you know, the PBL 1619 simulation, except for the shape of this radio variation is a little bit different. Um, but in terms of the magnitude, they are all within the um, error bar, kind of the overlap, the error bar overlap with the, uh, the observed observation. Uh, the, in the ultra core region, Outside uh, R three times M W, the inflow angle is a um, little bit uh, too large in the YSU simulation compared to observation. Um, I mean, close to the I wall region, uh, so you can see that that uh, the um, the the uh, also again in the the H wall PBR scheme is closer to observation than the other two uh, schemes. So, uh, do I still have time? Maybe I went too long. So in terms of the inflow layer depth, the, the um, I mean, actually in these three simulations, they're all comparable to each other and they're closer to observation. I mean, the YCU scheme is shows the slightly broader uh, inflow. Um, that's actually closer to observation. Um, and again, comparing the temperature field in the boundary layer to observation, in all these three simulations, again, even with the MIN and the YCU scheme, we do see, um, a, a cooler upper level boundary layer um, compared to observations, and also the um, this cooler boundary layer uh, in, in in all these simulations compared to observations. In the MIN scheme, is actually much cooler than the HWARF scheme. The HWARF uh, PBL scheme actually did a little bit better job than the other two schemes compared to observation. So I was, I think probably I run out of time, but just quickly summarize. Um, so we use observations to evaluate and improve uh, uh, boundary parameterizations in HWARF and uh, the observational uh, based, observation based uh, PBL physics led to uh, improvements in hurricane intensity and structure forecast by HWARF. And we use idealized simulations to understand why different PBL schemes affect uh, hurricane intensity and structure. And um, we found that uh, there's some biases in the thermodynamic structure so future physics upgrade in H work should consider this, and also uh, in future work will focus on evaluating the, uh, the PBL physics in half um, scheme in the half model using observation. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, to see if you have any questions. Sorry, I I couldn't too long. I think. Hi, June. That was a great presentation. Yeah. So I think we have time for at uh, you know one or two quick questions. Yeah, sorry, I went a little bit long. If you have any question, yes, Evan, please go ahead. Hey, June, nice talk. Um, you know, my question relates yeah. to that uh, equation for the vertical eddy diffusivity. Um, yeah. So one of the parameters in that equation is boundary layer height. That's That's the H variable. And yeah. uh, I guess I'm wondering if you think maybe is the diagnosed boundary layer height incorrect? Is it is it too large in HWARF, and that's why you had to introduce that alpha parameter to reduce the eddy diffusivity? You mentioned alpha is sort of a a tuning parameter. I'm wondering if there's something more physical you you could change uh, in the model. I believe um, Professor Robert Fauville, he looked at um, uh, looked at the uh, the changes in terms of the critical retention number. So when they vary the critical retention number, that could uh, change the boundary height. So in the in the uh, H curve, I think the critical retention number is 0 0.25. So um, so that basically determines the uh, the height of the the top of the boundary layer. I mean, the, when I compare that. I think I, I did some comparison before when compared the H1 forecast to the um, drop sound estimator is still uh, too large um, in the earlier version of the H1, it's like 2.11 version. But definitely the, there's, um, besides the, I mean, the alpha prime tuning is kind of 
non-physical, there may be other ways to modify the skin in a more physical way. Yeah, uh, this is Rich Rituno. Can I ask you a question, June? And yeah, hi, Rich. How are you? Good, how are you doing? It's nice seminar. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, thank you. one of the things that, uh, that uh, just sort of a follow up in the last question, but you know, in the limit, as Z gets small, then uh, KM should give you uh, a neutral boundary layer case. You should have a uh, logarithmic boundary layer. And there's nothing to be changed. Mm -hmm. But if you have alpha, it's like changing von Karman's constant. And so um, I would think that's it, that some way you want to get away from that. Otherwise, you're not going to get uh, the logarithmic boundary layer. You know, it's change something else. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I actually noticed in the 2013 paper, I, I, I noticed that too. Basically, when when we in, introduce the alpha primary in the boundary layer, so, um, so you know, at the boundary between the surface layer and the boundary layer, the, uh, the fluxes, they wouldn't match because we didn't put an alpha primary in the surface layer scheme. Yeah. So that a flux, there could yeah. be a discontinuity and that yes. would affect the, uh, the log layer profile. Yeah. Yeah, so, that, that, that's a physical problem. If you have a discontinuity in the stress derivative, that implies uh, infinite uh, acceleration. Right, because yeah, acceleration is proportional the, to d tau dz. Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah, you're right. But in the, the latest version of H2R, what EMC, uh, Wei Guo, one did, uh, so he, he changed the alpha. He also uh, put alpha as a function of height. Again, this is the kind of, you know, the tuning type of, so that uh, helped a little bit of, uh, oh, okay. uh, near the surface layer. So that reduced that problem. Probably a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Oh, again, so you leave it to be one, one near the ground, and then you have it increase or de decrease as you go up, something like that. Yeah. So basically, KM is a function of high, kind of like smooth a little bit of KM close to the boundary, uh, surface layer and boundary layer. But, but again, this this tuning still needs a little bit needs to be revisited. Yeah, I think. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, for um, operational model, I mean. Definitely, you see the structure is definitely improved a little bit, but in terms of the, this tuning method, I think we needed more work to uh, do it in the right away. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we have passed one. Um, I know you people have maybe more questions. Um, so Luisa, your online sh should we go ahead and stretch a little more or should we end it? Now, uh, you can go ahead and have a little more discussion if you want. I see a couple. I see a comment from Rob. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, if there's a couple more, go ahead. Sure. Rob, do do you want to speak to that? You wrote a comment. No. The well, the question Evan's question was about uh, did uh, was alpha introduced to try to deal with the excessively deep or apparently excessively deep PBL depth, and so my comment was it really had nothing at least directly to do with that. Um, all that was basically intended to do was reduce the magnitude of the mixing, so it didn't change the PBL depth. So the PBL depth that was a separate problem. Thanks, Rob. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the return number controls more of the PBL height than alpha, right? Yeah. Yes. So, if I could follow up with another question, um, based on what you're saying, Rob, like, is is the H in the equation for KM, was that materially changed by? the introduction of alpha, or that H is still pretty much what it always was? Uh, H was what it always was, basically determined by calculating a Richardson number extending from the surface to the model level being considered. OK, thanks. That, okay. That's I mean, if you, if you want, send me an email, and I'll, I'll send you part of a PowerPoint presentation that kind of walks you through that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, Any other questions?
now i think we have we are past time so thanks jun yeah. for the nice presentation and you know uh, with, when talking about the alpha parameter i know when we um, implemented the h war physics into halves that para alpha parameter went in two so it's moving on to half so probably we need to discuss more into whether we can really get rid of this alpha parameter even though we criticize it all the time but you know we sh uh, it showed from the results that after the pbl 15 you know many parameters of the pbl things um, improved compared you know to the previous version so uh, when we go did the changes and you know rob also made his contributions so probably we need a broader discussion of whether we can really get rid of this alpha parameter and you know make new changes based on observations so probably that will be a next project or something like that M yeah. mike do you have a comment oh no Uh, this is my kick. I was just ask. I was going to ask Rob if he could send me the presentation too, the one he's sending to Evan. Um, I couldn't type my question and had to leave and come back very quickly, so I just thought I would blast it in there, but I couldn't unmute or whatever. Anyway, thanks. Okay. Okay. Thanks everyone for attending. It was a nice one. So probably you know. June will be submitting the final report and you know we'll post the report on the DTC website and you know people can see it when they have time. Yeah, thanks this was for yeah putting this talk. Okay. Thank, thank you everybody. You. Yeah. And thank you, thank you very much, June. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Bye.